Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Paul Duncan McGarrity. Welcome to another episode of Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Paul Duncan McGarrity, on a beautifully sunny day here in London. I have got myself the traditional suntan, sunburn that comes every time the sun comes out for a brief second and has been uh, added to over years of working in the field uh, doing archaeology, which means that I have very bronzed forearms a dark patch across the back of my neck and on particularly unfortunate days a wide patch of suntan over the top of my bum uh, otherwise known as the archaeology sunburn Uh, so if you are already starting to develop that in your field season to you I give my uh, condolences Uh, as we all know you now look ridiculous with your t-shirt off so it looks like someone else's head belongs on your body as I have very regularly been told. Um, So, this is a question and answer session. Thank you everyone who sent in their questions to us this time. Uh, It's always very much appreciated. You can do the same if you send it through to at askanarc on Twitter. And I know we've had quite a lot of new followers on Twitter as well, so if you have come through from that and are now listening to the podcast, to you I say welcome. Uh, check out the back catalogue there's lots of fun uh, episodes there Um, I hope you find something that you like and uh, if there's anything you'd like me to investigate or anyone particularly you'd like me to talk to um, just yeah get in touch let me know what you think it's always 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 lovely to hear from you and uh, on that note as well thank you to anyone who has recommended the podcast to other people as well Um, I said it Many times before, and I'll say it many times again, uh, the personal connections are the ones that mean the most. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Now, as I say, this is a question and answer session, which means that I am joined by Laura. Hello. Hello. You're the best. And I'm not just saying that because... You have been married to me for uh, <laughs> some time. Some time. <laughs> it's not like I was going to say it, longer than <laughs> most people would think. <laughs> but um, uh, this isn't the first time we've tried to record this, is it? No. No. This is the second time we recorded this, isn't it? Yeah. Did we answer all of these questions in length previously? Yes, it was a very interesting chat. We've had I- a. L- We've genuinely had a lovely uh, afternoon and we had like a 40 minute conversation, maybe a bit longer, where we went through it all and we had like diversions and follow up questions and oh my God, what an episode it is that you will never hear. Because <laughs> uh, I forgot to delete uh, other recordings off my uh, device, which means that there wasn't enough space for it all, and it stopped recording after 14 minutes. Yay! Which, in one way, is quite nice, because that meant we just kept talking to each other, and it was a really nice moment as a couple. It was really nice. It was lovely, wasn't it? But then yeah. I had to go off and have a bath with a scented candle. <laughs> 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 like, genuinely, we're what? Three hours after that first attempt, <laughs> uh, and I, f- I, we, I finally calmed down enough to try and do it again. I mean, what an absolute idiot. Yeah. It's not too late. <laughs> is it recording now? Please it is. Please tell me it's recording The little now. red light is on. Uh, it seems to be going. I've deleted. And again, as you've, uh, it's probably worth pointing out as well. I've deleted all of the files that I uh, that were blocking up, and I uh, deleted one that I hadn't saved. <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, it's an, been a great day. It's another thing that day. I had <laughs> recorded, uh, the historical uh, paddle show, doomed to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> I deleted the backup without saving it anywhere. It's 
strong. Strong from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, all, it's all going to be fine this time, I believe. Oh, no. And we'll try and recreate our, our questions. Oh, bother me. Uh, yeah, it's, we'll this a, yeah, this is a long way of me saying, if anything sounds like uh, <laughs> really two people forced. trying to remember a really lovely conversation <laughs> they had three hours ago, uh, yeah, that's exactly what you're listening to. <laughs> so, there is actually one of the questions... In here. Oh, and also, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just because I was about to cough then. Um, I have a bit of a cough, so if I cough throughout this, I'm really sorry. Mm. It's a bit grim. Yeah, but there was one question we haven't ans- we didn't answer in the last recording. Yeah, so that'll be brand new. When we yeah, get yeah, yeah. So, genuinely, I'm not going to tell you which one it is, Ooh, but like, guess. secret game to yourselves. Try and work out. <laughs> and I'll say this. Is- which one am I actually interested in? <laughs> <laughs> which one is it that she is coasting through? <laughs> So, Laura went on. I've had a chocolate egg. I'm ready to go. Have you had another one? Yes. Are you on three chocolate eggs? I want three chocolate eggs. So, All right, okay. Let's do this. Oh, I have the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, first one is from Miss Allison on Twitter at mm. Miss A History. So, she has got in touch um, via at Clyde Bank High Archaeology Club. And would like to ask you, who is the most influential archaeologist you have interviewed and why? And then another question, what is your best find? And then they also say, we all listen to your podcast and it is helping us with ideas for topics and sharing our finds. Well, uh, first of all, Miss Allison, thank you very much for getting in touch. And hello to everyone in the uh, club as well. Um, it's lovely to hear from you and it's very nice to hear that you are listening in and it is actually having an influence on you. That is lovely. Thank you. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the most I could hope for is that this is having some sort of real world impact on people's, um, enjoyment and engagement with archaeology. So, fantastic. Um, if there's anything like, topic wise, uh, that you would like me to go into that maybe has been brought up at the club, uh, if there's anything I can do to help, really, just let me know. Um, send questions or send more questions or thoughts through Miss Allison, and I will I will try and get back to you all. Because um, yeah, I want to make it a two way thing. So thank you very much for that. Now the question: um, the most influential archaeologist that I have uh, interviewed on the podcast, and why? And why? Um, so I've got to split this into two parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think there are people I've spoken to who are influential for different reasons. Mm-hmm. That's allowed. And it's worth getting into. <laughs> <laughs> Just show your workings. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what's going to happen is the teacher going to send me, like, next message you get from Miss Allison is just B minus for no reason. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've nailed these ad libs. <laughs> Not, not that that's a clue that we've already answered this one. Excuse me. So, the first one, um, the first archaeologist is multiple archaeologists. If you go back, I did a, an episode where I was on Linda's farm at um, the Dig Ventures conference, uh, Dig Nation. And I was in Dig Nation and Ooh. I... Uh, got to speak to and meet a few people who had had a direct influence on me getting into archaeology. And they were sort of uh, the people who were involved in Time Team, uh, people like uh, Phil Harding and also uh, Julian Richards, who was the presenter of um, Meet the Ancestors. (laughs) Now, the reason I say that they're probably some of the more influential archaeologists is because of the impact uh, time team as a format had on the uh, perception of archaeology in the UK. So there was a uh, basically prior to um, time team, uh, there were a lot of really good documentaries. But if you go all the way back to like the nineteen fifties, it was uh, or the beginning of television. They didn't really know what it was that was supposed to be on. So like dramas were play they just had a play and they filmed it in a black box and put that on television Mm -hmm. it's all stilted and all that sort of stuff um and documentaries were kind of like uh they'd get an eminent professor like um mortimer wheeler or someone and they'd be you know 
uh, talking at the, uh, sat in front of a, a mocked up archaeological dig and then someone would go uh, of course we're talking about the Beaker Nation here and as he's saying it someone will pop up from the side and go hello professor we just excavated this I hope this helps and he goes oh, of course it does it illustrates my point excellently <laughs> and it, it was basically like um, uh, what's it called uh, on the fast show sort of like uh, Mr. Chamley Warner <laughs> <laughs> that was the sort of the vibe that they had on TV um, and so things had come on a long way but it wasn't until Time Team that archaeological uh, programming kind of broke into the zeitgeist. It, it became something that it, it led to things like, so sort of the height of a Time Team is brilliant. But then you start hearing stories afterwards um, where it's things like Two Men in a Trench, which was the uh, excavations on battlefields. Oh. Very specific field of archaeology. Uh, one of the guys is still involved in TV Pro. The guy who's on coast, Scottish fella. Uh, they, I, I remember an interview with them and they had a producer uh, come up to them and say that um, uh, archaeology is the sexy new programme. It's like the new cookery programme. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, now, that's horrible, right? But it comes off the back of um, Time Team. It was on a Sunday night. It was on a reasonably prime time position. And it was something that families would sit down and watch. And there wasn't a archaeological documentary format even mm. that had that same sort of uh, repeat audience. Yeah. And a huge audience as I well. I remember watching it as a kid. Yeah. Like, but as a... Yeah, family thing. We'd watch, sit down with, like, Gran and watch yeah. it. So. And they they even had, um, like, they, they they understood their power and their impact. So they did things like um, the big digs where they'd, they'd do live uh, broadcasts from archaeological sites. But even better than that, they had this thing where they had um, programs. Uh, this was covered in, in, uh, in the Dig Ventures um, conference where um, they encourage people to dig one metre by one metre test pits mm -hmm. and to record the information that was in there. And uh, Carenza, who, who unfortunately I didn't get to interview but was at their conference, showed the impact of that kind of like um, massive, uh, you know, wide-scale public engagement because just these little tiny windows, people digging in their back gardens and, mm. and under their patios. And there was lots of jokes about people <laughs> digging one metre holes under their patios at the time. Um, it's surprisingly good at giving an insight into, like a little window into the development of people's local areas. Mm. And it put that interaction in, in, between the audience and the program, it broke down the barriers of what was seen maybe prior to that as the sort of the ivory tower intellectual. Yeah, and the really academic. Yeah. And it sort of brought it to the people. Exactly. Like these test pit things were brilliant. One of the ways that they used it was to identify how uh, villages were impacted by the Black Death. And it was, it's such a simple idea. But you get enough of these enough people digging these one meter test pits, and what they record as they go down, like they're shown how to do archaeological recording, they're taught about stratigraphy, and in doing so, you make the whole thing. As soon as you spread knowledge, you spread understanding. People, uh, the interest levels rise, mm. um, and what they all they were doing was just recording the types of pottery that were coming up. And, you know, photographing and everything. And from those records, they were able to show when they, you know, the information was being synthesised centrally. They were able to show which areas were being depopulated by, uh, during the Black Death. And you would see um, some towns and cities would actually grow in population. Yeah. Like um, the 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 way that the certain industries, like if if one industry was heavily uh, labour intensive in the fields, um, and that labour force was depleted because people were, you know, dying off, uh, those areas would reduce, and you'd see that reduction by uh, 
like smaller and smaller amounts of pottery. But then other ones where um, you don't need as big a labour force, but there's quite a nice paycheck uh, overhead. It's a skill that people can pick up quickly. Um, I think like potting centres and things like that. People who had been uh, fleeing the Black Death, you actually saw population growth in those areas. Mm. Because once the Black Death clears, um, those industries recover quicker because they don't need that high labour intensive like nature. And so it's ready work for those people who still survive. And they and, could show that through And the... they could show that through these the 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 increase and decrease of the pottery because more pottery thrown away suggests people are living there people are breaking things people mm. are making rubbish and so these little test pits would be put all over a, a town and a village in people's back gardens and things and she could plot the the fluctuating look you know uh, maybe one corner of the town remains populated so they continue to produce waste and they continue to break things Whereas the other areas that have been depopulated, there's not there's a whole like uh, period of pottery missing that you would expect as just a background kind of deposition of material. Mm. So that is a real world application. It's a way of spreading the interest in archaeology, and it breaks down, as you say, the the barriers. It it makes it more for the people, and so. That's what Time Team did. It raised people's awareness of the profession. Mm. And um, as I've said before, th- there was a um, something called the, the Time Team effect of people applying to university courses. And it was something I was yeah. right in the <laughs> middle of um, when I applied to uni. And so my class was, the, my intake was 90 people. Um and subsequent to then, like the the height of it, it being in the public eye, uh, and lots of other factors as well, like the way that university is funded and, and fees and all that sort of stuff. But the number of people who are involved in archaeology is has halved. The I went to the Institute of Archaeology and when I went in, ninety people. And this year they had less than fifty people um taken in and just just, you know, the number of people has has hugely dwindled. Because I found that fascinating because not to give away which questions we were asked, <laughs> but because I was saying that there were there's so many archaeological programs out now yeah. that you were explaining the difference between those and yeah. Time Team. So with Time Team, you have recurring characters. You have the people coming back, and you know uh, you see Phil Harding week after week. People fall for him; they yeah. like him. And it's him who's doing the work. It's him who's excavating. It's the team, Carenza, and, 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 you know, and you have all of those experts that you see week on week. And the thing that changes is the archaeology that they are investigating, the site they're investigating. The format doesn't change. The, method, the, the focus on methodology doesn't change. And they were always very good at um, giving you the proper scientific and academic approaches and showing you all that side of it. And then you had Baldrick there yeah. to... To be like, what's this? Yeah. What? To <laughs> act, yeah, to act as proxy for the audience. So it was it was not dumbed down to attract the audience. But it's almost like it actually followed like the proper convention, like the, more the conventions of a movie. Where they, if you know, like if, you, if someone ends up in a fantastical world, Harry Potter is um, essentially. <laughs> I love that this is. So well, Harry fun. Potter is basically the the audience for a lot of that thing. Right. Think about it. Right. If if the Wizarding World and they they went through and they said all of that wizardy jargon <laughs> and they just assumed that you knew it all. Yeah. Right. If you didn't have Harry Potter there, it would be such a... Bo- you, you need Harry Potter there to be like... It's a translation. But why are we doing this, Hagrid? Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, and Hagrid is like, oh, because we need to record isotope levels in the spoon <laughs> so that we're able to work out where in Europe these people came from, Harry. <laughs> You're an archaeologist, Harry. <laughs> and you don't necessarily get that with other documentaries. Even really good ones like um, the Neanderthal one that Ella Al Shamahi did. It's a specific topic. It only covers a, a limited number of episodes, 
And yeah, the same people come back and you see them on TV again in different things. But the the journey they go on to rob from the opening uh, crawl of so many documentaries. You know, I'm going on a journey of discovery. <laughs> uh, it's different every time. You've got to set up the stakes. You've got to go back in. Whereas Time Team just was like, we've got three days. It's a monastery. Get on board. It's like um, soap. Yeah. <laughs> like your weekly soap. Or <laughs> weekly soap, yeah. But a little bit crossed with like, I don't yeah. know, a challenge program as well. And you could, and they didn't, they didn't shy away from showing arguments as well. <laughs> Genuinely, they what, were like really historical good. arguments. No, between people who were digging the site. What, like personal arguments? Like disagreements. Like you're digging or, on my bit. Not like you know, you're eating my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it was you would see them argue out the interpretation okay, yeah. on the evidence. The bill the, it showed you that build of evidence, and once you got to know the characters, you know, and because they were characters, they're yeah. real people, but. TV makes you characters, and repeated yeah. viewings makes you characters. Um, That's really interesting because then you don't you you get to see that there is more than one interpretation, perhaps, or like yes. you can dig one thing up, or you can see something in the yes hole <laughs> <laughs> trench. <laughs> trench. I was going to say stratigraphy. Stratigraphy, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I might have been using it wrong, but it's but it's you a... see, and then there's like a different way of. Mm. Interpreting it. A big part of the archaeological process is discussion. Yeah. Is it's peer reviewing, but peer reviewing when you write papers is all well, you know, it's is is an important part of it. But it starts when you're on site. It starts with discussions of understanding the evidence of of someone who's digging a trench a couple of things over might have found something that makes yours make more sense. It's a team effort. Mm. And that's something Time Team always got over. And some of these other documentaries, they emphasise individuals who are, uh, I'm going to find this out. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, I'm really going to that. find yeah. this out. Or it's like about one ac- one person's academic study. Yeah. Not like the group experience of... Of and, and dissenting voices. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I think, why it, what its influence was. It's... It influenced a lot of people to get into it. I think you might start seeing... Like, Digging for Britain's got elements of it, but Digging for Britain, uh, the way that it's filmed is that people are on site kind of make their own uh, video diaries and they call from that a little bit and then every now and again they'll turn up and one of the presenting team will go, oh, what is this? Mm. So they become... The presenters, instead of being week in, week out, being seen as the leading uh, experts, are now the proxies for the audience. Mm. So the audience is getting to know the audience each week. You know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a subtle difference. Uh, but it means that the experts that you see are an ever-changing kind of like cast of people. It makes it look like a bigger industry and you get to see all these things. But the fact that they record it over a year and then do like this series of the north, the south, east and west. It's more like a... Uh, I was going to say, the, the sort of the... I was gonna, <laughs> what came into my head was the in-memoriam bit of our, uh, the Oscars, but that's a terrible analogy. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, here's all of the sites that died this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but it's like a state of the industry. It's kind of like... Uh, like a roundup. Yeah, a roundup of here's some really interesting ones that, that we're we've, doing. That we've done, mm, yeah. rather than like we're doing... That we've yeah that uh, and occasionally it'll be like there's some ongoing work still but yeah it's it's what has has gone yeah um, and time to time to do some really boring sites as well didn't it yeah <laughs> whereas like it's not uh, not the big jazzy ones exactly so sometimes they turned up and they found nothing which was <laughs> genuinely the most fun episodes because it was just wonderful to watch them walking around going you know. <laughs> Basically, because there's another phrase that archaeologists use, which is evidence, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Hang on. Say so that again. Absence of evidence mm-hmm. is not evidence of absence. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Right? So it might mean that you've put a trench in, found absolutely nothing, and you go, ugh, 
this field is empty. But what you've actually done is stuck it in the one bit of garden next to the massive Roman villa. <laughs> <laughs> and you've see, you've gone through all the layers and gone, mm, nothing but garden soil here. <laughs> and then the next time someone digs, they'll find this incredible site. So you can't ever say categorically, no, there's nothing here. Mm-hmm. What you can say is, there is nothing in, in the trench yeah. that I have dug in this particular right location. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it's it's different, is, is what I'm saying. I, th- I think that's the influence that Tantin had. Did you find out about archaeology through Tantin? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but no, I didn't find out about archaeology no, through Tantin. No, I didn't, anyway, because I'm, think, I'm trying to think, I think maybe I did. You reckon so? Like, maybe. Yeah. I don't remember having an understanding of digging stuff, old stuff up from before Time Team. Do you know, maybe it solidified my understanding. Because I think I was one of those kids who came from the dinosaur angle. Oh, uh, like, yeah. Paleon- I, kn- I was I knew- really into yeah. dinosaurs. Like that. I knew the term paleontology when I was at primary school. Uh-huh. Like, I remember distinctly a teacher asking everyone what they wanted to be when they were older, and I said paleontologist. And, I th- yeah, I think they had to, like, it was for something they were... We had to do, like, an artwork to say what you wanted to be in the future. Mm. And uh, I, I, she... My dad was a governor of that school, which meant that, horribly, uh, for years after I left primary school, all of the teachers would come round to our house for a barbecue <laughs> once a year. <laughs> So when I was deep into my teens, this particular teacher told me that uh, when I said that, she had to, like, make a quick excuse, go to a dictionary, find out how to spell it, and then pop it down on the bit of paper for me to do the artwork around. Oh, so she didn't know. No, no, she didn't know either. Oh, what a little know-it-all you were. Yeah, yeah, I was was a right little nerd. (laughs) Yeah, heavily bullied. (laughs) Um... But I think it evolved from that. I think the the paleontology was kind of like the the routine, and then I I had the I had a, a really good uh, video that was like uh, Hypsilophodon, Taurosaurus, Agrosaurus. That's about enough for them. Um, <laughs> and I would learn that song, and then it sort of evolved from lizards. To be, I think my parents were like, well, he likes lizards, let's take him to museums and stuff. <laughs> and so I'd go to museums and then I'd find out that there was stuff in the past and people. And then I was like, no, people are way more interesting than lizards. Because uh-huh. I can kind of, I wanted to understand people's motivations for doing things. Um, yeah, so it was a kind of an evolution. So, I, But I think Time Team was a big part in there. Of uh, making me understand and or giving me access to sites that I couldn't walk up to or or mm. anything. And so, Indiana Jones. And Indiana Jones, of course, yes. <laughs> who uh, who you know you watch Time Team and you're like, oh, this is what it's like, and then you watch Indiana Jones and this is what I hope it's like. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, you said there were two people. Two. two, yes, there were two. Uh, the other one is one of the early uh, interviews that we did, which was uh, Stephanie Ostrich. Now, Stephanie Ostrich, this one represents um, an organisation that she was part of. She's no longer involved in it. But at the time, uh, she was running the Citizen programme, uh, which was a, well, is sorry, still ongoing, a massive um, volunteer programme based around uh, preserving and recording archaeology in intertidal, coastal, uh, and sort of riverside setting. And what's intercoastal? (laughs) (laughs) Very good, Baldrick. (laughs) I can't Uh, take on the Tony Robinson character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But seriously, what is intercoastal? <laughs> um, so land archaeology is covered by land archaeologists uh-huh. and, and archaeology and all the planning laws that mean that that gets dug up quite regularly. In This is the UK. Um, marine archaeology, which is the uh, deep sea diving, going down on shipwrecks and looking at uh, uh, flooded sites. Um, 
there's a lot of it going on around uh, the Greek islands, obviously. Nice. Yeah, every now and again you'll hear a, uh, you'll see another, uh, what was it, newspaper headline. Archaeologists find, op- you know, uh, open quotation marks, Atlantis. <laughs> and it's just another. Remember the British Museum? Um, a while back there was that really uh, quite grand exhibition of all of the... Um, Egyptian statues and everything that were taken from one of the coastal sites and basically the whole thing had gone underwater no. uh, <laughs> d- 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 I don't know oh, it was it was fine as a display it was sort of like they were they they it was supposed to be uh, a quite a religious center uh-huh. and so the whole exhibition was just all the temples and statues they found and there was like one cabinet on the day-to-day life of the people which uh-huh. I thought Come on, <laughs> but it was it was that's the kind of stuff that marine archaeologists will deal with. Completely submerged, totally submerged, yeah. Um, so intertidal coastal sites fall between that; they fall between the cracks. So it's like, yeah, it's okay. too wet for the land people, <laughs> too dry for the water people. <laughs> so nobody's in charge of it. It's not it the, no no. It, 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 it's more that it, it, well, they don't uh, fight over it. They don't find it, but also it's the, the funding side of things. There's a lot of archaeology that's interesting there. Um, there's a lot of like, because it's damp, <laughs> material of an organic nature survives really well. Uh-huh. So they've uncovered things like well, shipwrecks, obviously, uh, trackways that are Paleolithic, uh, forests, <laughs> uh, possibly in Wales. Um, Tusks of mammoths have come out of cool. the investigations there. So obviously it's a really archaeologically rich area, but it's also one that is constantly changing. It's changing for a lot of different reasons. One, rivers erode stuff. Uh, storms blow things out. Uh, uh, storm season at the beginning of the year is like the busy time for Citizen because the storms blow shipwrecks that have been submerged for centuries onto the shore mm-hmm. and they've got to go out and record them quickly because those same um, storms back out, wash back out or smash them to pieces Oh, okay. because waves will start hitting them and it'll just break it apart um, wave action uh, coastal erosion all of these things are impacting on the archaeology and it is a huge area that I mean that is difficult to monitor if you just ha- use uh Professional archaeologists. It's like our coastline is massive and wiggly. It's so wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> and you, if you had like a few, like we are running at a deficit of archaeologists. We keep getting told this. We haven't got enough of them in the UK uh-huh. for all of the jobs that are needed. So you couldn't police the whole coastline. So Citizen is um, a project where uh, volunteers are taught how to use an app that they can download into their phones that helps them record potential archaeological sites of interest around the coast Mm -hmm. as they're wandering around. This has a couple of different um, advantages. Number one, they know the local area. And in going out and looking for this archaeology, they get more of a kind of... uh, Volunteers get more of an ownership, an understanding of their local area. So it brings the archaeology and the the protection of it into their... into the, the, the sort of the the thoughts of the local people and so it connects them a little bit more with the archaeological material that they are investigating and the second thing is it helps target uh, resources if you've got this massive group of people all over same as the, digging all those one meter trenches mm. you yeah, increase like, uh, the rspb like monitor the birds in your garden thing yes like those sorts of things that you see as well exactly that kind of thing like you couldn't send people out to go and count all the birds you'd have 20 people running around going have i counted that one (laughs) i I think i can't could you all stop flocking (laughs) uh yeah so it, it increases the range of the project um and by monitoring the impact on those archaeological sites. We can use them as a bellwether for how climate change is affecting coastal regions. Uh, storms are becoming more powerful. Flooding, uh, Flood action is going to impact directly on those sites. And as such, 
they can be used as a check, as a, a way of monitoring um, what we're losing. Plus, what, there must be some really cool stuff as well. So much like, cool stuff. Because people have lived there on coastlines and yes. rivers for For essentially, ever. All, like, look at London. London's riverside is just... Even that paints um, a picture that you don't really appreciate until you get into it. Like, one of the things that was brought up by them was... uh, Oh, Gustav Mill uh, wrote a a piece on this quite recently about the secret uh, groups that... The secret group of civil engineers and workmen who uh, ran around mid bombing raids during World War Two, trying to repair the river walls Ooh. when they were struck. And they were hit like I think it was two hundred times or something in that region and they were breached. And what the basically they were never directly targeted, or it doesn't seem that they were directly targeted by the Luftwaffe. But they hit them a couple of times. Yeah. And they had to have this secret group go and repair them because one if they'd been allowed to collapse, the Thames would have Flooded. come at high tide and just millions of pounds worth of damage to central London. Uh-huh. Like, beyond what the even the bombs were capable of, mm. right? The river would have just, just torn buildings apart. Uh-huh. Uh, they had to do it in secret because they thought, the Luftwaffe aren't particularly aiming for the river. Yeah, but if they found out... But if they found out that we worry about it this much... They definitely would. <laughs> so if you're walking down the river, you can still see the patchwork that these men, in secret, whilst bombs were still falling, did to save the city from its own river. That's really cool. Right? I didn't know that. Exactly. It's still a secret. Yeah. <laughs> but... That's just one story on the Thames. And the Thames is just one river. And the history of so many countries... I mean, Citizen's just a, a, a sort of an England kind of... I think Scotland's got something separate, and I think Wales has got something separate. I think it's only in, in, in England and the English coastline that it operates. But... Think of how many cities have a river running through them. Mm. Uh, think of every coastal town. Think of ports and the fact that we were a maritime nation. We had that connection with the world. The story of Britain and the, the history of Britain is written in its rivers and waterways. Mm. And it's this thing that just because of planning or because mar- uh, maritime archaeology is quite a new, relatively new branch of archaeology, they go a bit... They go a bit too much watery, they go a bit too much yeah, land. I just and can't just believe that, it's not covered, because yeah. it seems like it's so important. It's also tricky to do, because... Soggy. Well... Really, really soggy? Think of... Uh, things like uh, stratigraphy is a little bit harder to do. Wait, you like dig a hole? No, 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 no. <laughs> And then dig a hole? No, 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 no. Well, if you actually look on, like, riversides, the... Um, Instead of being in like nice layers, like um, if you're digging a normal trench, yeah, it's like smushed. It's all smushed up because it's a liquid. It's sort of a, a semi-liquid environment. Yeah. The soils are all churning. If anyone walks down like a, a muddy thing, they're churning through the layers when they've been laid down. So what you'll actually find is, um, uh, if you as you're walking along, you'll find evidence of uh, multiple. Uh, phases of archaeology all visible at the same time so you'll see you know medieval fish traps it it near in sort of like near the the middle of the water but you'll also be able to see 18th century barge beds made of chalk Uh and it'll all look at the same level but only because the river is constantly lifting silt dropping silt churning it all around so i think it's there's an element that it's is it's it too, hard. Is it too hard? It's no one hard. wants to do it. They're like, let the people do it. The people. It's too hard for us academics. But yeah, it's it's just, um, yeah, I think it's just something people, uh, 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 until more recently, and there's a huge movement towards recording it, and, and Citizen's a cornerstone of it. So yeah, 
the reason I bring that up as influential is because I think it is a model, a newer model of doing archaeology. Um, and I think there are a lot of problems with in the, the UK model of doing of funding archaeology. I've covered this previously, and I, I genuinely think that more different, uh, diverse and innovative models of carrying out archaeological um, investigations is important for the industry because it doesn't tie us to one revenue stream and one way of doing things. Do you think something like Citizen could have come about without something like Time Team? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know. I, th- I think you did need to increase the interest level. But I also know that people are interested. Anyway, people are interested in history. There are so many historical societies and various things like that. I um, Maybe it's more of a kind of like... Maybe it's the sort of thing that Time Team would have done if it had continued on. Mm, like into the technological... Like yeah. Using apps and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like you would have had the Time Team engaging app. engaging people, mm-hmm. yeah. So I think it would have maybe existed without it. But I think it's not unreasonable to see it as a evolution of what Time Team was doing. Yeah. So it's sort of standing on the shoulders of giants without directly acknowledging it. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Excellent. (laughs) Because felt like waffle to me. Um, right, so they... the best thing that I found was that the next part of the question. Yeah, I was just going to find the so Miss Allison. They ask, yeah, what's the best find? I've had so many things that I found that I, it's it's all good. <laughs> it is it is all good. I I oh, I've got a question then. What's the yeah. worst thing you found? Oh, what's the worst Before, thing that I found? And then we'll get back to what's the best thing you found. Um. <laughs> I I was kicking through some uh, Victorian landfill in uh, on the site of the Olympics, oh, and yeah. the the trench was partially flooded because mm-hmm. we had a really explosively high water table, mm. which happens when you have clay sitting on stuff and well, it that... just pushes it all down. That, that doesn't class as into coastal. No, it does not. It counts. <laughs> it counts as an engineer. Right. We all knew that if you broke the clay and got to the the. Uh, the water table. Uh, the water table and the and the uh, sort of gravel layer below, the water would shoot like pour out of the ground because it was under it was it was being held lower than it wanted to be. It was below sea level by a quirk of the geology. Right. And we all knew this. And in this particular one, an engineer came over and was like, "Oh, how far away is the gravel?" And he got a road iron, which is like a four uh, four foot long uh, piece of metal with a spike on the end. And he pushed it through the clay <laughs> until he hit the gravel and went, oh, that's a lot That's a lot sooner than I expected. Pulled it out of the ground, walked away, and we just watched him walk as, well, let's call <laughs> it a, a three-foot jet of water <laughs> came spurting out of the hole he just poked in the clay. And we're like, oh, we hate you. So that flooded <laughs> everything. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Um, but, so... There were like nine metres of landfill on some parts of the Olympics. and uh, Like old landfill? Victorian. Okay. Victorian... Uh, <laughs> I was thinking you are like... No, in a Victorian like industrial and household waste. Okay. So it was kind of... Bottles and t- toothbrushes and bits of bone and industrial waste and lead uh, and nice. radium and like... Anthrax. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. It was a grim sight. I'm glad you didn't tell me this at the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm walking along, kicking through the water, trying to like, get to the other end. And my foot hit like a lump of stuff. And uh, when I looked down, there was like this flash of white in the water. Muddy, muddy brown water with these splashes of white. And uh, I looked down and I've kicked loose 
about 50 glass eyes from dolls. Oh, God. That's so creepy. <laughs> and so like, they're all like looking at me out like, of the muddy water. Out of the water. Oh, I would have screamed. <laughs> I was like, oh, not like this. <laughs> Taken by the bog monster. Horrifying. Yeah, that's pretty grim. Okay, so that's the worst thing you've ever mm, found. I found human hair as well. Ooh, yeah. Okay. That was uh, that was a cemetery about six years ago, and the soil conditions were a little bit damper than you would like. So it preserved it. Hair, a bit of scalp uh, tissue, and um, oh. uh, the soil had uh, like a chalkiness to it, which is fat. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so they're the worst things you've ever found. E- yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Just for different reasons, they're they're a bit grim. Um, um, best thing. Let's go for the best things now. I've they're too grim. Found someone with leprosy, which was quite interesting. What? How is that the best thing? It's really interesting. It was a medieval um, burial, right? And their finger bones were all withered to nothing, like the lower finger bones and the maxilla, which is um, the bit just underneath where your nose is, was uh-huh. dipped. Um, and yeah, I was like, I'd never seen anything like this before. And the osteologist came over and went, oh, they have leprosy. Their toes had fallen off, their fingers had fallen off, and their nose would have fallen off as well, which is what, why the bone was dipped in. Oh. Yeah, exactly, you see. They're horrible, but like, I'd never seen an individual with leprosy before. Oh. Fascinating. And just interesting to see them buried in with everyone else, you know. It's one of those things that I, I don't know if this is me or, or, but you you hear leper and talk about like medieval times. You think, oh, immediately thrown out of society and you know uh, cast aside. And this person was right there, buried in amongst the middle of the population. Yeah, thought that was a really interesting mm-hmm. quirk. Um, similarly, we found people with uh, like really badly broken limbs, but clearly uh, heavily developed arm muscles that suggested they were on crutches. But that says a few things. It says that they they injured themselves, but they got just enough medical attention to survive yeah. the injury. And they also um, they survived long enough that their injury healed and their bone structure changed because of habitual use of a crutch, which means that they were kept alive, you know, somehow. That, an injury like that, you would not have been able to do heavy labour. But they've lived a long, like a long enough life. So someone's looking after them. Yeah. And again, it's that you, you have an idea in your head of a medieval society of like disposable attitudes to people. And it's stuff like that where you're like, oh, no, no, they people always cared for people. People always people. So yeah. it sounds like the things that you like to find are where it's, yeah, you you imagine the person and the people and the community yeah. that they were part of as well. I didn't find this particularly, but... Um, like it connects you straight yeah. back to... I didn't find this particularly, but I was on a site where they found some witch bottles. What are they? Witch, oh, I love witch bottles. So they come under like um, uh, apotropic marks, which are like um, protective symbols that were put they were sort of popular in the 16th 17th century a little bit earlier as well and there'd be marks that would be put above doorways above fireplaces to protect the house against attacks by witchcraft and witch bottles were uh, sort of like that as well what they would be is like um, a little beaker or in this case something called a pipkin which is a small imagine a saucepan with a clay handle and ball and everything. Mm -hmm. And in it would be uh, metal nails, fingernails, hair, urine, and it would boil it all together and bury it at weak points in the house, in the threshold of doorways or next to fireplaces, the points at which a witch could attack through into your house. And the idea was, because you'd put your fingernails and urine and all that in it, if the witch came in, they'd... She'd be like, oh, what? Oh, no, I do not want to be here. No, it would act as a, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, a decoy, and it would attack that, thinking it was you. Oh, it's like all your DNA, yeah. isn't it? 
I was going to so, say, it's like... Like a heat-seeking <laughs> missile. They're just throwing that chap and stuff to try and baffle it. So, but it also kept their guests away. No, I mean, like, if they're boiling it. <laughs> and we got a little saucepan of fingernails and pee. But you buried it in the floor. They don't oh. know it's there. It's not next to the door. <laughs> it's buried in the ground next to the the doorway. <laughs> it's not like, please step over the pee. It's fine. <laughs> so, oh, have you got a witch? Po- I've got a witch problem. Yeah, yeah we had a man in. <laughs> They're in the walls. They're nesting. (laughs) You can hear them. Hubble, bubble, toil and travel. Um, No, but that's it. So the reason I like that as an object is it's an object that shows you people's mental state at the time. Mm. It shows you... It's an artefact that reflects real world fears of witches. And people doing an actual activity to try and protect themselves. So it changes things like um, the opening scene of Macbeth, which opens with three witches on stage. Now, for a modern audience, that's, you know, just the dramatic uh, launch point where Macbeth isn't paying enough attention to realise that they are actually foretelling his downfall. Spoilers. Um, But for an audience at a time who are actively taking measures to protect their house against witchcraft three witches on stage to begin with would have been terrifying or could have been a terrifying thing for them to see the 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 involvement of witchcraft in that person's story isn't a fantastical tale it's a oh yeah witches do do that (laughs) and so it it changes your understanding of how people treated the world around them I thought you were going to just say something like some cool treasure. I have been an archaeologist for over a decade. I've been on sites where gold has been found three times. And all three times that gold was very small amounts. (laughs) Even the big golden spoon I found was plated gold or painted gold. Where was the big golden spoon? It was in the middle of the River Thames. Someone dropped it off a boat. Very funny. Um, I like that and I like finding keys. <laughs> I like finding keys. Cause it's... Why? Yeah. Because you know someone... Again, it's that connection of going... You, you just imagine someone going... Oh, oh yeah. Where's Lots that key. key gone? <laughs> oh, I'm sure it'll turn up eventually. You <laughs> mean picking it out of the river. Yeah, there's probably some of mine. <laughs> going to get dug up somewhere. Hundreds, hundreds of years hundreds time. Hundreds of years time. Some future archaeologists like, do you know what? Just like how annoyed this person would have been. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So those are my answers, Miss Allison. I hope they were um, useful to you all. Okay, so next question um, comes from IWM on Twitter, mm-hmm. and he says. How about at Kat Jarman's recent work on the Viking finds and how far they came and settled and, brackets possibly, forged alliances only a few generations after Offa had Mercia? I I don't understand many of those words. No. So, (coughs) first things first, I think this is is one of the ones that um, I had to do a bit of research on to answer because... As we uh, we get a lot of questions coming in on very specific sites and topics that I don't necessarily have um, expert knowledge about. So I'm going to do kind of a broad strokes approach to this one. If it doesn't cover it properly, I apologise. But I think there's some interesting stuff to discuss uh, within it. So it's worth uh, bringing up. Um, so the first thing that... Uh, we should talk about is the Great Heathen Army. Oh, cool name. Yes. Or the Great Army. The Great Heathen Army comes from uh, the... um, Yeah, did they call themselves the Great Heathen Army? uh, No, they did not. (laughs) (laughs) Because that was really cool. No. The the Great Heathen Army came uh, from um, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles where they were referring to a massive army of Danes and Swedes and Norwegians who had come over and 
And prior to uh, the Great Army, or the, the Great, yeah, the Great Heathen, Heathen Army, Army. Um, the Vikings... They sound like a biker gang. <laughs> they got the aesthetic. Big beards and Yeah, so I'm just leather. imagining here, leather jackets, like, with Heathen Army written on the back. Yeah. Uh, but they, uh, prior to this invasion, they would mostly gone with raids, like, turning up, like, lads, 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 lads. And... <laughs> Uh, just attacking and, and leaving, and this was sort of the first um, big movement to try and grab land to actually invade. Um, part of it, you know, there's, there's they aren't clear why this particular time happened. This is in the the uh, the late ninth century, um, and it's not clear why it happened, but it seems to be possibly a king. Uh, of the Danes came over and was leading a raid and was captured and executed uh, by being flung into a pit of poisonous snakes and his sons... In this country? Yes. We have no poisonous snakes. Adders. Just, just a pit of adders. Such a very slow a adder death. A lot of adders. Adder death. God, they would have spent hey, years collecting adders. Laura, Laura, their bites not might not be that dangerous, <laughs> but they, they adder up. Oh man. Oh man. Oh wow. But I somehow don't believe this historical record. No, I don't either. But Adders is. Ad- Unless no. we had lots of poisonous snakes in the night century. That we have lost. Since lost, yeah. But this was the story, and then some of his sons, I think he had five sons, and like four of them were like, Oi! You've killed our dad, we're going to invade. So they did. And the army spent several years fighting during the summer in various kingdoms of the Ang- uh, various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Yep. What? Where is Mercia? Mercia's sort of in the Midlandsy kind of area, or was kind of like the Middle uh, Kingdom, so Nottingham and all that kind okay. of area. Uh, there was uh, Wessex, East Anglia, more uh, Alfluster, uh, but yeah, Mercia, <laughs> Mercia, some, some others, some yeah, Mercia, Wessex, East Anglia. <laughs> Uh, Kent. Uh, I can't remember any others. Sorry, sort of. I don't. I don't know any of them. No. <laughs> I mean, people would be like Sussex. <laughs> oh yeah, Sussex, <laughs> Wessex, Sussex. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, they kept attacking various people, like uh, Alfred the Great. Got his Alfred the Great. Alfred the Great. <laughs> got. Uh, had a couple of tussles with the Great Heathen Army uh-huh. and he paid them to leave the first time. Uh, great. And then the second time he beat them in battle. Oh. So, yeah, uh, pretty good. So, uh, what Dr. Jarman what seems to be looking at is uh, a couple of sites. One particular one at Repton, which is a cemetery that... Uh, Repton, I think my understanding is that it was the last encampment the great, the great army had before it started to break up. And when it broke, started to break up, uh, some of them went up to Northumbria and to York and started to settle. So the importance of the site is it is a, a turning point between this invading army and some of the parts of that invading army deciding to uh, settle. So they're like, oh, we quite like it here. Yes. Let's settle down. Yeah, yeah, and it turns it turns the you know Northumbria into a Danish kingdom uh-huh. and Dane law and all that sort of stuff. Uh-huh. So uh, that's what she's investigating, and it's a uh, it's it, it seems to be quite an interesting uh, piece of information. It's something that, um, as I say, I don't fully know everything about it, but the reason I think it's worthwhile talking about is she is using something called ancient DNA Uh in her investigations. Now, ancient DNA is kind of a big thing in archaeology at the moment. It is um, one of those uh, topics that... And we talk about the uh, uh, time team effect. The CSI effect is something (laughs) else that uh, deals with DNA. And what it is, is like um, juries are apparently more likely to 
believe DNA evidence because they've seen it on TV. Because it's been presented. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's like, this is fact. You've got no hope. We've got DNA evidence. Uh-huh. you got nothing, Copper. That, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is that it seems like the be-all and end-all. And that is something, uh, a way that uh, ancient DNA evidence in archaeology is being presented in the general press quite a lot. Um, you'll see stories uh, of the conversation I had with um, Andrew Gardner. We were talking about how that was uh, started by uh, reading an article where uh, it was pointed out that in recent times there was a... Um, uh, an archaeological site that used ancient DNA to show people had, uh, you know, there was this community that had moved over from Europe in the Middle Ages and were living in England. And it was used by both sides to both uh, support and uh, undermine the arguments for Brexit. <laughs> I politicised it. And yeah. so the archaeology itself is not, you know, the archaeologists aren't going out there to, to necessarily make a point. And to say one way or another, but it's just, it's, um, because it's something that's used to identify migration and, and, and groups like that and family groups. It can be something that it's, um, reported in very simplistic terms and the public see it as a hard and fast be all and end all because they've got this idea that DNA is, the thing. So, with all that passing aside, DNA is a very powerful tool for archaeologists if it is put within that context. And we can see that um, Dr. Kat Jarman has actually been using some ancient DNA and they found some really cool things. Um, they have identified at the Repton site uh, double graves uh, or, or two individuals buried in the same grave. Um, that's not that unusual, right? Though. Double graves like this are common in the Viking world, actually. And it's one of the things that has helped identify it as a, a Viking burial site. But what's interesting is that uh, DNA evidence seems to suggest that they have a direct family, familial link and that there is a 20-year age difference, both male, meaning that they are very likely to be father and son. That's cool. Now I'm quoting from a tweet that she put out, a long sort of story tweet, big uh, 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 sort of like a line of text here. And um, what are those called when you've got loads of tweets together? Oh, feed? No, that's not right. <laughs> Many tweets? Add to this story. They have a particular <laughs> word for it. Anyway, she did a really long one <coughs> on the 21st of April uh, 2019. And the fourth one here says, while DNA can't in any way prove their identities, mm-hmm. uh, forensic details are very good match to Olaf, Viking King of Dublin, killed 874 in Scotland, and his son, and his son, Einstein, I think. Einstein. E-Y-S-T-E-I-N-N. <laughs> Einstein. I mean, Instant? it sounds perfect, what you're doing here. At uh, Einstein. <laughs> Killed 875 by Halfdan, uh, both with close links to the Great Army. So she's, uh, you can see there, the DNA isn't the be-all and end-all of it. It is identified a familial group, but it's the other, uh, other evidence, the forensic evidence, which is um, sort of, uh, the height of the individual, uh, any pathologies and injuries that may have uh, occurred, um, cultural artefacts that are buried with them that might suggest a particular artistic um, sort of uh, grouping that it, it's come from, mm-hmm. uh, an artistic tradition that it is, it's based in. That evidence, that forensic stuff outside of it, is what is added to the DNA to start making those links. And... Uh, tying it to this great army that Repton potentially uh, represents the turning point from them being an invading force to an occupying and settling force. So that's why it's it's really interesting. So what they're settling down, having families. Yeah, yeah. but it's it's uh, 
Yeah, like familial. I'm working. I'm working on a cemetery at the moment, and we're using DNA to try and identify familial groups because if you can find, uh, if you don't find many links with the familial groups, the population, you might be seeing a an itinerant group of people who are like. Um, I think a big influence on the Vikings going on raiding. I think this is brilliant, right? Uh, only the firstborn son could, under Danish law, inherit their father's lands oh. and wealth. Which meant that if you had extra sons... Oh, they had to go find it. They had to go and find it themselves. Is that why the Vikings came over? It's one of the reasons. But yeah, basically, <laughs> you've got a lot of second sons going, just rowing angrily, like, <laughs> run, <laughs> bloody <laughs> hate... Stefan is stupid being born first and getting the house. Because <laughs> you had to have, you know, your money and everything to... Um... So if you're finding, like, unrelated familial groups, you've probably got, like, a band that's here. So there's there's been... An army or a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or a bunch of lads on A bunch top. of lads. But um, in the population that we're investigating at the moment, we are f- about to do DNA evidence to try and identify to see if there's larger familiar groups. Because if you get multiple generations or like uh, multiple individuals from within a, an identifiable familial group, you've got a much more stable population. You've got a much more sedentary population who are, uh, uh, you know, uh, developing within that society and, and staying for generation after generation. Uh-huh. So you change over from an invading force of individuals to if particularly if you see it over a long period of time, a sedentary group who are putting down roots, staying yeah. in one place, That's really interesting. developing uh, the society. So um, as I say, I think it's it's well worth looking into it. What I can understand from the outset, it's it's a really interesting. Thing. But I wanted to mostly talk about that ancient DNA thing. Um, yeah, if you go to her Twitter account uh, at Kat Jarman. Uh, you can follow a lot more and find out a lot more about the things that she's uh, uncovering. It's, it looks like a really interesting site and, uh, and, and one that's uh, you know, yielding quite a lot of interesting uh, insights into the development of uh, particularly the sort of the northeastern region. Mm-hmm. Okay, so next question comes from Han Danskin. Mm-hmm. And they ask, can I join the team? <laughs> what team? <laughs> I mean, uh, apart from uh, yourself, on a, you're the most a- appearing guest now. Whoop, whoop. By a considerable a margin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and other than that, it's just me. I do all the login. I, I do all the recording. I sometimes forget to delete the files <laughs> and make people do it all over again. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you need a team. <laughs> maybe I do need. Maybe I need an admin person. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I need. A, I need. I need someone to do sound. Someone to do admin. And uh, if someone could do the interviews as well, I'd have a lovely old quiet time. No. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'd miss it. I enjoy it too much. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no pay, no medical. Uh, <laughs> we don't do holidays. Um, there are- no perks. There's, there's literally no perks. But, yeah, more the merrier. I, you're all part of the team. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I think that's a lovely offer. Thank you. Um, just mostly thanks very much for listening, Han. Okay, so the final question for today is from Paul Simo, or Simo. Hmm. My apologies if I'm saying that wrong. Again on Twitter, and he asks, "Has there ever been a dig at Saint Ninian's Hermit?" Sorry, Ninian's just made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been a dig at Saint Ninian's Hermit's Cave near Whithorn in Scotland? And what were the findings, if any? Well, Paul, there have there have been two excavations, and the reason I can tell you that is because I found out that. The uh, local sort of archaeological uh, organisation that covers it, which is Canmore, or if you go to canmore.org.uk, they have put all of their archives online digitally. I know, and I think that is one of the most important things that an archaeological unit can do, because 
Um, one question I get asked a lot when I'm doing my uh, community engagement work is, uh, will there be a report? Yeah. And my answers usually are, yes. But not eventually. for you. <laughs> eventually there will be a report. And then there'll be a book that you can actually read. Uh-huh. All right. So uh, what goes into the public domain? A really good example of this is there was a book that came out really recently uh, about a princely burial at Prittlewell of an Anglo-Saxon prince. And there was loads of uh, material found in in situ with them. Uh, There was like weapons, grains. I think there was a chessboard. There were lamps. Uh, It was a timber-lined chamber that had collapsed, but you could see where the woodwork was and some of the lamps were still in the original position. Wow. Because the soil had filled in and and held them there. All of that. Amazing, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. Took them fifteen years to write the report. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. Yeah, so I think making archives available to the public is a really, really important part of the archaeological process, and one that now with more sort of like online digital repositories is becoming easier to do. So fair play to Canmore; they have put everything up. So, I would like to tell you, based on what I discovered from their website, what was found during the excavations. So, St Ninian's Cave is a natural cleft in the cliff face. Uh, Its floor, 25 feet above sea level. Excavations were carried out in 1884 and 1950. It was found that the occupation levels were of no great date, the earlier levels having been destroyed. Basically, everything that was in the uh, cave floor had um, been wrecked, right? So there was, there were, there were newer stuff. It, it, basically, it was the same as we're talking about coastal stuff anyway. It eventually gets flooded out or uh, windswept. They, you don't get that deep um, uh, stratigraphy. Uh-huh. In the cave, it was it, so. What they're saying is, no, nothing's that old on the ground. It's uh, it's all been wrecked and replaced. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, seven early incised crosses cut uh, are cut into the rock of the western wall of the cave of the cliff face outside. They are now protected by metal grills. Mm-hmm. Try that again. They are now protected by metal grills. <laughs> I like grells. Grells. They sound like magical creatures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. Don't go near them, <laughs> said the metal grell. Uh, other cross-incised stones from the cave in Win- uh, are in Winthorne Museum and one in the National Museum of Antiquities in Scotland. So you can go and visit it if you want to. The early crosses dating from the 6th and 7th or 6th or 7th century show that it was used by Christian recluses. It must have formed the focus of some hermitage associated with with Thorn. Uh, most of the crosses date from the eighth and ninth centuries, and the latest one being part of an inscription in Ang- uh, sorry bearing part of an inscription in Ang- uh, Anglian runes is of eleventh century date. This was a headstone reused in a paving slab, which must originally have stood in or near the cave. And this is the really interesting bit. You ready for this? Because mm-hmm. mostly it's just they carved like, crosses in, in mm. the stone face. In 1884, a skeleton was found buried in the outer part of the cave. Possibly this burial was of a hermit who had retired to the cave and this cross was set up to mark his grave under guardianship. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, also found there uh, was a stone wall to do with uh, spinning, uh, polishing stone, and part of a deer horn handle, also two cross incised stones. But the really cool thing is, if you want it, so you can read all of that and it'll tell you all the information, but I'm just showing you now, they've also put up all their digital images. So you've got photographs of all of the crosses that were uncovered oh, yeah. there as well. Oh, you should go look at this. <laughs> <laughs> 
This so, is very yeah, cool. yeah, click on the digital images and you can see some of the. I think they've got photos from the 1950s, and it looks like there's a, a later um, recording job there as well because they've got some more modern looking photography. Oh. So, there you go. It looks very picturesque as well. It does, doesn't it? It looks lovely. <laughs> So you it's can, really cool that this is all online, though. Exactly. So you can go find out. And that's why I think that question's really fun as well. Because sometimes when you go and people ask about these specific sites, in the case of, like, Dr. Jarman, we were able to go and have a look at what she's putting out. Because she seems like someone who is very good at doing uh, community engagement. <coughs> and she's excited to tell people the things that she's found, which is really good. And that's one side of things. But... The other side of it is when the organisations themselves make it easier for the general public to access records on their own merits instead of uh, waiting for someone to tell them what's cool. Yeah, 15 years to wait for a book. 15 years to wait for a book. Kind of lose the edge on it. A little bit. (laughs) A bit bit boring waiting for that. I know, and we're in a digital digital world. People are moving towards digital recording on sites as well. Uh Traditionally, it used to be Uh, pen paper and all that sort of stuff and those skills should constantly be taught and they should be used on sites because if every all the technology fails you still need to be able to draw uh, a decent section drawing Uh, just in case there's anyone who's looking to get into archaeology learn the old skills before you start using the new (laughs) ones Um, but digital recording on site full digital recording on site allows for records to have notes attached to them to have photographs attached to them, to have images of the finds that you have uncovered put on to them directly. So straight away, you are already starting the interpretation process. You're giving people... The hardest part of it, of pulling a site together, is trying to understand what a person meant on a, a sheet. <coughs> because everyone... As I said earlier on, it's the discussion you mm. see between people. That's good and on site and all that sort of stuff, but occasionally in the record it it disappears that discussion, and it'll just be one person writing their observations of the things that they found. But it'll be it that can sometimes be dependent on how good that individual is at writing descriptions, or how accurate they are in writing descriptions, or their own personal, you know, feelings and preferences as to what is important mm. um now you ask me to draw you know to, to record things there's a chance my subconscious will really focus in on any hard standing archaeology uh, bricks mortar building stuff because because you're naturally really interested in that yeah and yeah. i and i i'm drawn to their that side of things um there might be someone who is really really drawn to um recording all of the different uh, animal types that are represented by the bones that are in a, a, a thing. So how can digital help with that then? The images. You can take pictures of what's actually in front of you and you can annotate them and add them to the written description. So that. And you can't do that? You can take photographs, okay. but think of it this way. You can take a digital photograph, you can immediately attach it to the record, and then you can write on the photograph itself the notes of... I oh, think this away. is I this. You, can, you don't have to wait I can for your do photo this to come through to come later. Through yeah, yeah. Attach it to the paper at record. that moment in time, you can say what you're looking at because a photograph even can change the subtleties in color or texture that you can't get across. Mm-hmm. So in that moment when you've photographed it, you can have your eyes on it and go, "This doesn't look clear on the photograph, but this is a lot softer here, mm. so this is a different material." And you add extra, you know, a, a bit more of an immediacy to the, the record, we've still got a long way to go with making it better. Um, and isn't there a danger, though, that mm. record, I mean, all records this stuff could are, go? Yeah, yeah, like, we don't that's, know that's how the long beauty it'll last. of paper records, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like getting stuff on microfiche. And... But you can print out digital stuff. That's true. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a, an argument to be made that at present, a lot of it's make hard copy, turn digital. It's a lot easier to make digital, digital and, and then, then make a hard made copy. hard copy. That's yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and I, I still think there is a lot. Of, I mean, a lot of archives still don't accept digital archives; they accept hard copy archives. And there's still some 
processes that need to be worked out. But I think there's a lot of advantages. And one of them is, as we can see with uh, Canmore, you can make it far quicker. Mm. You can make information available to the public. And it's... Archaeologists aren't working just for themselves. They're not working for an academic institution. They're not working for a commercial wing. They're not working for that. We're working for the public because we are creating evidence and knowledge of our collective shared past. It's not my history. It's everyone's history. Mm. And everyone should have access to the information that we've uncovered. Mm. I think... Very interesting. I know. I'm, I'm, it's not a fully popular view. I know there's some people who are like, nope, we should get, keep some of it because they won't understand unless we tell them what it is. But I, it's a bit condescending, isn't it? I guess there is some level of analysis, though, isn't there? Because otherwise you can put out... I mean, you are professionals, you are trained in this. Otherwise you can just put out anything and everything that you find. Actually, and, yeah. And but... you don't... Like, if I looked at it, I would, I'd be like... Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see what I, think, I would make of some sites. I think I'm being glib because I know that there are, there are some occasions where um, uh, some messaging, like they can go, we don't want to talk about this now. And there's reasons why people don't talk about certain things. Like um, I've been on sites where they won't announce uh, that they've uncovered certain kinds of material like uh, an Anglo-Saxon cemetery because the fear is if you say that before you excavate it then you end up with uh, night hawks uh, uh-huh. the the people so most metal detectors are very good but the very small majority a small percentage of them are terrible um awful now <laughs> this is a PG podcast so I can't say what I was <laughs> going to say about them but they'll break into sites and and rob it <gasps> Mm. Very naughty. So yeah, there's a reason why. I'm <laughs> that was a moment of glibness. But for also me, interpretation as well, surely. Mm. Yeah, and it, and that's why we are professionals in it. But like, I can't imagine other professions mm. putting all their findings. <laughs> like you can t- what what they did there without... is there was a summary. That ah, summary okay. that I, I said, and the pictures that go with it to, to show you that the it doesn't take much to put that initial. It's that initial stuff. That initial summary. And then summary. it'll be 15 years. For, until and the then book. 15 years for the book. Okay. Yeah. That's, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, it, it takes me a bit of a while to get around. I'm, I'm all for full... Um, what's it called? Full transparency in our work. <laughs> and I'm just going to strap a GoPro to your head while you're hey, digging. I've pitched it. <laughs> <laughs> I said we should do a, a virtual reality one where uh, people can... Like get a live stream on a VR headset and oh, sort of like cool. drive an archaeologist by wire from afar. Although, is it a bit like it's like what we were saying earlier with Time Team, where you dig in a trench and find absolutely nothing? Oh yeah. Is it also a bit like slow TV? We'd just be watching you like dig brown, <laughs> like. I mean, yeah, absolutely. For hours and hours yeah, yeah. and hours and hours. Yeah. And the GoPro would definitely not ha- ha- have to have its microphone disabled. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, maybe not the most thrilling TV <laughs> or VR. I'm actually going to a conference on the use of VR in archaeology, really? so yeah, I'll see if I can find anyone interested that to talk cool. about that. If you, if that sounds like something people want to hear, just drop me a line. Um, are we done? I think so. That's all the questions for today. Yes, blimey! Yay! Thank and you. has it recorded? It has, oh, by the looks of yes. it, which is nice. Um. Laura, thank you so much for doing that twice. It's a pleasure. It's very interesting. Is it a pleasure? Was it a pleasure the second time? It wasn't bad. And thank you for throwing in some new stuff. There was genuinely new stuff in there for me. I know. Me. And they'll never know what the old stuff was. I know. <laughs> but no, it's very, very interesting. Cool. Um, I particularly like the Viking stuff. Nice. About the settling down. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about that. Like familial groups. Mm. Cool. Right. That's it for another episode of Ask an Archaeologist podcast. Woohoo! <laughs> I've been Paul Duncan McGarity. No, I haven't. I've been Paul Duncan McGarity. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, bye-bye. bye bye. Bye.
You've been listening to the Ask an Archaeologist podcast with me, Holden McGarrity. The music you were listening to was by From the Ashes. Check them out on Bandcamp. It was produced by me, Holden McGarrity. You can follow me on Twitter at Ask an Arc, or you can send an email at askanarch at gmail.com. But most importantly, if you've enjoyed yourself and you think you have a friend who might be interested in the podcast, please tell them about it. Write a review, put up a star rating, let people know that we're here. It's incredibly helpful and much appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who has asked an arc. Bye-bye.